and good afternoon and welcome everybody to the second edition of Vulcans Football 2015 for the second week of the 2015 Vulcan football season. I'm your host Gary Smith and uh, I'm joined as always on this early Tuesday morning by California's Sports, Informa Sports Information Director Matt Kiefer and Toronto Blue Jays aficionado Matt Kiefer as well. Thank oh. you for coming over. We'll talk about the Vulcans here today. The more positive news <laughs> there than what happened in Toronto last weekend. Well, it was, a, it was a rough weekend for sports fans of both the Vulcans and the Blue Jays, apparently. Not the Pirates. So, you, know, you can check your local talk shows for that because the Buckos are in the midst of a pennant race. But second week of the season for the Cal Vulcans wasn't uh, as kind as week one. As, uh, a tough Bloomsburg team came into the game. And Matt, this game, it was a, probably a great game to talk about the week leading up to it for fans because you had California going into Virginia State in week one and thumping a playoff team last, or a 2014 playoff team in Virginia State. Bloomsburg coming off of a tough loss at home to Stonehill, which in Stonehill is not Notre Dame by any stretch of the imaginations. So a lot of storylines going into the game. And what turned out to be, it was, a, it was a good college football game. Unfortunately, California came up on the short end of the stick. This is one of those things you always expect when you play Bloomsburg anymore. Uh, they're going to run the ball, they're going to play good defense, and they're going to run the ball. And that's pretty much the script they kept to. Uh, they kept the Vulcans down to 13 points uh, on Saturday after the first week. I think they had 13 points in the first two minutes at Virginia, it seemed like. Uh, no matter what they wanted to do against Virginia State, quick strike offense, touchdowns on the board, or this weekend just really struggled to get anything going. Uh, one of those things, you play a team like Bloomsburg, you can't commit turnovers, you can't uh, commit penalties, and you can't leave points on the board either because of turnovers or just taking field goals instead. And unfortunately for the Vulcans, they did all three of those things. And it started out... Uh, pretty good for California to a 13 nothing lead, but as you just alluded to, California in a couple drives had stalled out in the, deep in the red zone, and against a team like Bloomsburg, a battle-hardened team, you have to get seven points instead of three, any time you can. Yeah, I'm sure Coach Keller and uh, special teams coach Larry Wilson were glad to get William Brazil some kicks to see, okay, what's his range? Is he good in games? Let's see how everything goes. But at the same point, you don't want to just be relying on those kicks. You don't mind taking those if you're up 20 points later on in the third, fourth quarter. But by keeping it 13 nothing, Bloomsburg's not a quick strike offense by any means. Uh, you just sort of keep them in the game longer, and it plays almost more into their hands. Uh, you know they're going to run the ball, and in the second half they get that one big run uh, for about 50 yards, and after that it's just found hole after hole. You get four or five yards here, four or five yards there. Uh, short third downs, quarterback did a couple of nice runs, as their quarterbacks always seemingly do. They can run it when they need to. They're never going to pass for 200 yards, but they can run for 30, 50 yards if you need them to as well. And Bloomsburg always reminds me of a, and this is no, no disrespect, but they always seem to remind me of a high school team that plays the same system. You have people coming up from middle school playing the same system, and it seems like you plug jerseys in instead of players, and that offense just keeps chugging along. It's almost like one of those things, like Alabama, before Lane Kiffin came in, they always had those big running backs, and they always seemed to go top five in the NFL draft. What they did in the NFL always was never a certainty, but at the same point, you just put in whoever you wanted to, and they're going to play that kind of game, and that's the way Bloomsburg is. They lose uh, 2,000 yards from last year's rushing attack. Well, it didn't seem like they mattered much on Saturday. Uh, Elliott rushed for over 160 yards, and their backup here had over 70 yards, so it just didn't really matter who it was. They've gone one back before, they've gone two backs before, they've even got, used three different running backs in the last uh, handful of years, and they're always successful, whoever it is, and running back by committee or for just one big guy. And it seemed like in the second half of that game uh, that California turned the ball over and they lost the time of possession battle. And that's two things coaches always talk about. You can't lose if you want to have a good chance to win the game. You don't want to lose the turnover battle and you don't want to lose time of possession. Because it seemed like Bloomsburg had the ball for, I don't know the number off the top of my head, but around probably like 18, 19, 20 minutes in that second half. It was actually 21 minutes because that was one of those things I was looking at for the notes in the, after the game. I'm like, I can barely remember Cal having the ball. You get it, next thing you know, you lose it on either downs or punting or whatever. And it just seemed like Bloomsburg kept having the ball. And, of course, they run the clock down. Uh, they, hu they huddle up. One of those few teams in the PSAC this year that actually know what a huddle is and where everybody stands in the hell. Most everybody else just goes to the line and checks. And that can sort of mess with the defense, too, because you're used to playing one pace all for five, six weeks in a row. Then you face that team, and you're like, wait a second, what's this? We get a break here. And it's just their offensive line, they've always been big. They've always been strong. Uh, Defensive-wise, last year they led the country in takeaways, and this weekend uh, they had three picks. So, I mean, they did what they needed to do to get the W. And despite, you know, the second half not having the ball, California still had a chance at the end. It was almost the same script as last year where California needed a big drive uh, to tie the game. California was driving at the end of the game, got in a good position, and, and just the fourth down, or I think it was a fourth down play, just did not result in a touchdown that would have sent the game to a possible overtime. I mean, they had two, drafts, two drives in the last two and a half minutes of the game. 
where they had a chance to really take care of some, uh, either win the game or just tie it. Um, but both times, uh, first drive, uh, James Harris got sacked on both opening plays of those drives. And anytime you take a sack at that situation, it's hard. Uh, but at the end, it was really playing all those last three minutes of the game. It could tell almost like the D coordinator said, okay, anything I told you the rest of the, before the game, just let it go. Just go all out. They're going to pass the ball. And it was really tough uh, for that one uh, tackle for Calgary to be able to hold that D lineman uh, and stop him from getting to Harris either with sacks or by forcing holding calls. And another thing that kind of hurt that, that potential game when you drive and also pretty much the last two and a half quarters of the game, California's a big, one of their big offensive weapons, Gary Brown, went down, which obviously – hampered the offense uh, for the rest of the game because he's a big guy and a big threat to have not on the field for the Cal Falcons. I mean, you can just go back to the opening week and see Gary Brown had four catches for over 200 yards to tell you the kind of playmaker he is. So anytime you lose that in your offense, uh, it's definitely uh, demoralizing for James Harris. I'm sure it's always a comfort blanket to know he's there, where he's going to be. Uh, at the same point, though, eight different guys caught a ball, so everybody sort of stepped up where they needed to. Uh, it's just one of those things. It wasn't a great uh, day necessarily for the Cal U offense, but the defense, you look at it, they had a lot over 200 some rushing yards, but they had a ton of attempts. Uh, and anytime you do that, I think it's you'd be okay with that kind of op uh, offense you're facing blooms where they're going to get seven, eight yards. They kept them to four or five almost every time. Yeah, like I said, when I was talking to, to some friends after the game, I mean, it's a Saturday afternoon. It's a college football game. I mean, I... As a fan, I always like to think it's exciting whenever you know both teams. It's, you don't know who's going to win, and that's what this game was Saturday. It was a great college football game, um, and all's not lost. It was the same script as last year. California beats Virginia State, loses to Bloom, and then uh, we have Shippensburg. But before we talk about Shippensburg and the standings and everything, all PSAC and Cal Vulcans related into the future, we're going to take one last look back at Saturday's action against the Bloomsburg Huskies from a – Blustery, I wouldn't say blustery, but it was a nice fall uh, afternoon in western Pennsylvania. Here are the highlights from Cal Bloomsburg 2015. For the score, Harris going to step back and throw. Goes to the end zone, and it's intercepted. Oh, my goodness, what a pick there by the Bloomsburg defender. So, Harris in the shotgun. Give me a handoff again to Franklin. He is going to get in the end zone. Well, let's see. The officials have a more kick. Now they do. Touchdown, California. The seven-yard kick attempt up, and it is good. Brazil makes his first career field goal as a vault blowing, so we'll see how that affects it. Kick is up, and it is good. As Brazil now two of second and ten. Harris back to throw. Downfield, and that one's intercepted. Second of the day. So Harris, he's not big in the distance on his throws today. Kelly, back to throw, under pressure, throws it downfield. Man's not even looking, it's intercepted by Chaz Field, goes out of bounds, no time left, and that's halftime. It's first and 10, 7.35 to go, he's going back to throw. Goes downfield, and it's intercepted again. That's the third of the day for the Huskies. That's number 53 for Bloomsburg. We'll see who that is, that's Tyreek Clary, and he just came right in front of Kelly going to sneak it himself, and there's going to be a flag after the play, and he's in for the touchdown as well. 24-yard attempt. Here it goes, and it's up, and it's good. So Bloomsburg, no, it's no good. Oh, my it's goodness. It's no good. It's going to be a pitch to Elliott. He's going to get the first down. He's going to get a touchdown, and it's the Bloomsburg Huskies take their first lead of the game. Day. No one was out there. You gotta go end zone. Could be the game. Harris gets the snap. Looks to throw. Does it in the end zone. And it's overthrown. And that's the game. Don't miss your chance to catch the best pro wrestling on the planet. Ring of Honor returns to the Pittsburgh area at the Convo Center at Cal U. Friday, September 25th at 7.30 p.m. With appearances by the Briscoes, Jay Lethal, Adam Cole, and many more. Experience body slamming, super kicking pro wrestling action live. Visit ROHwrestling.com now for tickets and info. The time is now, the place is here. Stop running, face your fear. When it all comes down to this, you only get one shot, can't afford to miss. The time is now, the place is here. Stop running, face your fear. When it all comes down to this, you only get one shot, can't afford to miss. So let's get it, let's go. Go hard and go home.
Since 1937, the Student Association Incorporated, known as SAI, has served the Cal U student body by providing activities, programs, and services. Every enrolled student has the ability to take part in over 125 different clubs and organizations. Managing participation in every SAI activity is easy with OrgSync, a powerful tool for staying connected. Located one mile from campus, the SAI farm has 94 acres of meeting and recreational space. SAI, it's your student association. For almost 30 years, CUTV has been the campus and community home for local news, sports, and entertainment. Broadcast in 100,000 homes in southwestern Pennsylvania, CUTV provides complete coverage of Vulcan sports as well as high school football coverage. Broadcast weekly live, CUTV News Center provides coverage of local and campus events, weekend weather, sports highlights, and feature stories. For more information on CUTV, check us out on the web, friend us on Facebook, or follow us on Twitter. Now it goes down the field. Harmon has it. He is going to walk into the end zone. Shippensburg moves very fast on this drive and is quickly fixed up in the Red Raiders. Hand it off to Roberson. He is into the end zone. Touchdown, Vulcans. Roberson gets six points. Going to pass it. That's a touchdown, California. Kawan Scott. That's Brooks on the outside run. Gains a couple yards, fumble. Terry got recovered. it. It's a handoff, Grissom. Able to work his way into the end zone, touchdown. Nick Grissom fighting off a swarm of chip and brick defenders. It's a run, Roberson. He is into the end zone. Harris takes the handoff. Gonna go downfield, has a receiver. It's a touchdown, Kawan Scott. California right now doing everything they want. There's gonna be a run by Lashi. He's gonna be going into the end zone. Shippensburg gets a score on their final drive before halftime. Here's a snap, fake handoff. Lashi going to pass, has a receiver. It's caught, Sheldon Mayer, six points. Harris. Hands it off to Grissom. He's going into the end zone. Touchdown, California. They strike right back. They get another three score game. Back to pass. Throws it over, has a receiver. That's a touchdown for Shippensburg. Hand off to Grissom. Grissom going to the outside. He breaks the tackle. He's going down the sideline. He's going down the sideline. Five into the end zone. Touchdown, Nick Grissom. Second of the game. Lashi back to pass. He's going deep down the field. He has a receiver wide open. That's Mayer. It's intercepted. That's Corey Ford. Come out of nowhere. Lashi back to pass. Throws it over. That one's intercepted now. That's Chaz Veal. Lloyd with the punt. It's going to be blocked. Guess who? Another handoff to Grissom. He's going, busting up the middle. He's going to the outside. He's going back to the middle. He's going to go to the end zone. Touchdown, Nick Grissom. Back to pass is Lashi. Under pressure. Has the pass. It's a touchdown. And that Ooh. extra point is blocked. That's Rodney Gillen on the block. And welcome back to Vulcans Football 2015. This time we were ready to come back. We weren't talking about uh, internet issues. I'm once again your host Gary Smith, joined by Sports Information Director Matt Kiefer. Matt, um, we just saw the highlights from last year's Shippensburg game, and no, it wasn't a, a Madden game you were watching there. That was the, the offense that both teams put up. An exciting game, and I think we're going to see more of the same this year. I think it's one of those things you look at Shippensburg from the last four or five years once Zach Zuli came in uh, with that offense and won the Harlan Hill. Since then, they've been one of those offenses every year. You can see them put up 50 points. You can see them put up 30 points. None of those numbers would really surprise you much. And it's one of those things I think Cal has to be ready to go to put up another big number because uh, their first week of the year against Seton Hill, they threw up 50, where last week was a low-scoring game against Edinburgh. Uh, but they can win both ways. So that's something you have to be careful when you play an opponent like that. And I think if, if you're California, I, you know, and as a fan, I really am looking forward to this matchup because obviously Bloomsburg was a tough matchup. 
But I think this is the perfect opponent to get back to, regardless of the outcome. I mean, you know you're going to be able to put up points. It's going to be a track meet. And I think, you know, that's just what the doctor, the football doctor ordered, Dr. Football RX. I mean, it's just the way it worked out last year. You had the disappointing loss of Bloomsburg in overtime, one you fought back to get to overtime in the last uh, play of the game regulation with a 50-yard field goal, something you don't see in the D2 ranks very often, and then to lose it the way they did with the pick on the first play on overtime, then forcing Bloomsburg to settle for a long field goal, but still a tough loss, sort of like last week. You're up 13-0, you think you're in control, and next thing you know, Bloomsburg just continues to throw those jabs and eventually it takes its toll and you look at the scoreboard and you're like, oh, it's 20 to 13. <laughs> uh, Shippensburg's not going to be that kind of game uh, with their offense and their head coach. Uh, they will put up the points. They don't mind spreading it around. They also can run the ball. They're running the ball a lot more the last probably year, year and a half than they did when they had Zach Azuli, which when you have a quarterback like that, uh, they lose Trevor Harmon, who was one of the all time greats in the PSAC in terms of a receiver. Uh, he tried out with the Arizona Cardinals this year to tell you how good of a wide receiver he was. He wasn't just a guy who was a fluky guy in offense. No, he had some next level kind of skill. And they have a couple guys now who you never know. They have some voids to fill. Uh, and they looked at Harmon last year on tape. Maybe they saw something. They liked the, these guys coming back. And they've got some guys who are looking to see if they can make that step. And with the defense, on the defensive side of the ball, if you're a team that scores that quickly and that much, that defense is going to be on the field a lot. Uh, so California, you would think, are going to have, regardless, are gonna, if, even if they're scoring a lot, they're going to have their shots on offense. And you mentioned in the first part of the show the, the number of receivers that California hit in the game against Bloomsburg, the number of different receivers. With Gary Brown you know, shaking up last week, you know, that's going to be good to be able to spread the ball around to a lot of different receivers and hopefully get the ball going up and down the field and track meet style. I mean, even if you lose Gary Brown, you hate to lose a receiver of his quality, but you still have an all-conference caliber guy in Kawan Scott, who's one of the biggest playmakers in the league. Uh, you have some younger guys, Luke Smory, uh, Tom Green, Desmond Green at tight end, no relation between those two guys. Uh, Jordan Danridge came in last week, uh, one of those numbers you hadn't seen before, uh, but he came in. So you have guys who can fill in those roles. Devin Lomax also uh, made a couple of nice catches there late in the game once Gary Brown went down. So there's still options there, uh, something with Coach Keller's offense. No matter who the quarterback is, who the running back is, there's always be wide receivers. Uh, every time you lose one or two for graduation or senior years, you're like, okay, who's next? Well, there's always another 1,000-yard receiver basically coming in. Uh, last year, you know, Gary Brown had five catches at all his freshman year and he becomes an All-American. So I'm sure there'll be some uh, – James Harris will find some uh, guys open and make some plays happen. And I looked at the, uh, the weather forecast before I came in this morning. The, the preliminary forecast looks like it's going to be a great afternoon for football. Uh, on Saturday, um, so hopefully that'll be good. And because you never want to see a bad rain game with offense like this, you want to see what the two offenses can do. Um, it'd almost be like watching Oregon play in the mud somewhere. It's not, you know, it's good seeing an offense like that, but you don't want to see them in the mud. You want to see both teams firing on all cylinders. I mean, I think you know, looking back at last weekend, uh, weather forecast was supposed to be thunderstorms and rain, and honestly, come game time, it was pretty much open, and both teams were even. Where you figure, okay, if it rains, maybe it is the team that runs the ball. 40, 50 times a game have an advantage over the team that prefers to throw the ball. Where the day sort of played out, it didn't really matter weather-wise because it was at least a neutral uh, game, which you'd like to see that make the elements not be a factor. Like they seemingly always are at Bloomsburg, always are at Gannon, and always are at Lockhaven. Yeah, luckily for us, uh, Slippery Rock got the brunt of that uh, thunderstorm. If you saw any of the, uh, the game on TV or any of the, the pictures, it was, it was nasty weather. And, I mean, we've all been in it, so it's always good to be sitting at home <laughs> and not being in, in the middle of that, uh, that quagmire. I mean, it's one of those things. That was the national game of the week for the NCA and D2. They put it on their uh, CBS Sports Network and on NCA.com. So, I mean, they, want, they knew it would be a good game with two legendary coaches who've been around the game for a long time, some marquee players. And for it to look the way it did on camera and even play out, I'm sure it's not what the NCA and everyone involved with that project, except unless you're Slippery Rock, <laughs> uh, given the result. I don't think it's what they wanted to necessarily put out there for the viewing public to see. But, again, uh, it's one of those things both teams have to play in it to figure a way through it. Let's take a look around the PSAC from last Saturday's action with the scoreboards and see how everything shook out on week two's action. It was all PSAC all the time. It was, it was crossover weekend, weekend number one of crossover action. The Thursday night game was uh, Millersville at Clarion, and Clarion uh, with the win. But Millersville, give them credit for, for bouncing back after that uh, somewhat demoralizing loss to a, NA, or a D3 school uh, last week. I mean, Clarion 2-0 and to start with a new head coach. I guarantee there's some momentum building up there that not a lot of people saw. Uh, coming earlier in the year. Now moving on to the weekend games, Westchester Mercyhurst in a, in, a, in a pretty good battle. Mercyhurst sneaking it out 37-35 and 
you always got to worry Mercer starting fast because they usually start slow. Uh, that's one there you got to definitely keep an eye on Mercer. It's in Westchester. I mean, they lost their All-American tight end due to eligibility issues before the year, and they're really struggling out of the gate here 0-2 when they were thought to be one of the top teams in the East. Shippensburg making the trip up to Edinburgh, uh, sneaks by by the 20-13 uh, to 13 score. Uh, Cheney and Gannon, that was close for the first half, and then Gannon uh, kind of knocked the cobwebs out and uh, put it to Cheney 44-6, six, Gannon going to 2-0. Uh, Lockhaven and Seton Hill uh, in Greensburg, PA, Seton Hill winning 27-10. And then the game that uh, we were talking about at the station all day yesterday, IEP and Kutztown, uh, Kutztown uh, winning 34-33, but it was the way they won, coming back from a pretty sizable deficit at IUP to get the win. That was one two years ago. That score didn't make sense either. It's just one of those things that seems like Kutztown, Indiana, has Indiana's number. Not many teams do, but the Crimson Hawks always seem to struggle with the Golden Bears, whether the Golden Bears are supposed to do a lot of things that year or if it's supposed to be a down year for them. And then the last game we, we alluded to earlier, uh, in the rain and the muck, Slippy Rock uh, beating East Stroudsburg 34-9. We're going to switch right over immediately into the uh, standings through week two. Of course, there are no conference games yet, so this is just reflecting the overall records. Uh, Clarion sitting atop the PSAC with them, Gannon, Mercer, and Slippery Rock all starting 2-0. California and Seton Hill, 1-1, uh, one one, IEP 0-1, and, and then Edinburgh 0-2, and, uh, and this will change uh, in the next couple weeks as we start. I think it's a nice play. thing looking at last year, kind of confused some people making crossovers count. <laughs> uh, this year back to nor uh, basically what has been the standard and the norm uh, with the idea of no conference uh, games until about week three, or week four of the season. So uh, this week's loss to Bloomsburg doesn't hurt as bad in the conference perspective as it would have last year when they started 0-1. And, and I bet you that's nice on the sports information side. A lot less phone calls saying, what's what's with the conference records going on? Yeah, it's one of those things people sort of got used to it last year, then switching back, and it's like, oh, yeah, it's just like normal. Last year didn't happen. So I think those, <laughs> those numbers were an admiration. And let's go to see what's out in the wild, wild PSAC East. Uh, the only undefeated team, Shippensburg, 2-0. Uh, and and then you have Bloom and Kutztown, 1-1. One and one. and then uh, uh, Trevor Tr Treasure Trove of 0-2s, Cheney, East Stroudsburg, Lock Haven, Millersville, and Westchester. And Westchester's a surprise at 0-2, but they had a tough start. Oh, yeah. I mean, what they had to go on, I think they had Lenore Ryan the first mm -hmm. game, and then at Mercyhurst. Uh, we've both been there. Mercyhurst is not easy, uh, especially in November. But the way Mercyhurst is playing right now in September doesn't seem like they know what month it is. Uh, they're just playing well. But Westchester and East Stroudsburg, they're both going to get some wins this year uh, looking at those other 0-2 teams, and they're both going to improve. And uh, with Soltz as a quarterback for the Warriors, uh, they're definitely going to put up some numbers. And let's take a look at the upcoming slate of matchups this weekend. Uh, in the PSAC week three of action is going quick. Uh, here's your complete schedule uh, in uh, chronological order of when the games happen. Uh, Seton Hill at Westchester. There's the R game, Shippensburg at California. Lockhaven at IEP. Cheney at Clarion. Gannon at Kutztown. Edinburgh at East Stroudsburg. Mercerist at Bloomsburg. And Millersville at Slippery Rock. And Matt, I, I, besides our game, the Shippensburg California game, I'm guessing the game we want, everyone would want to circle would be that. Mercer's Bloomsburg game. I mean, that's the team there. Uh, again, looking at that right there. That and the game in Kutztown game, see if Kutztown is that one, one week wonder with IUP or are they doing something this year. Uh, but the way Mercer is playing this month in September, uh, they are a team I did not want to face. Maybe it's better we're playing them in the October, November for once this year. Uh, but Bloomsburg, they just got a big win against Cal U, so they're going back home. Uh, I don't think they can ill afford to go 1 and 2 to start the year. And if they would have lost this week to Cal and possibly gone 0 and 3, uh, people would definitely would be wondering what's going on over at, uh, in Bloom with the Huskies. And you know what? I'm going to piggyback on your Gannon Kutztown there. I, I didn't even think about that. Gannon's not a team that uh, they've been good the last couple of years, but always seems they take a weird loss in the middle of the season. Mercy Hurst is always a trap game, and there's just that one random game. You're like, how'd, they, how'd that game happen? And this might be that weekend, given what Kutztown did last week. And, of course, this Saturday, uh, if you can't um, – I don't even know what I was going to say. But get to Adamson Stadium, Shippensburg at California, 1 o'clock p.m. Uh, it's going to be a, a pretty good college football game. If you can't be there, that's what I was going to say. If you can't be there, uh, shame on you for one, because we, we'll get your red and black out and get to the stadium. But if you can't be there for whatever reason, uh, log on to calvalkins.com at 1 o'clock to watch the live CU TV feed. Um, and as you might have heard me and Matt talking about before, uh, hopefully the issues uh, on the sidearm side of things will be resolved. Um, because me and Matt don't like pulling our hair out <laughs> during the game too much. Um, so there's all the broadcast information. If you want to hear the radio-only feed, uh, you can listen to uh, WCAL online only because we have to turn the transmitter down for home games. And now uh, everybody understands with the Steelers and Patriots why that actually is <laughs> yes. important you do that. <laughs> I think I was the only person smiling when that whole thing was going on. Like, see? See? And because that's what we've had to deal with for years. Um, as we mentioned before, the live CUTV broadcast can be seen on CalValkins.com. Um, the tape delay uh, will be Monday at 6, Tuesday at 4 o'clock. 
And then if you can't watch it there, can't watch it live, um, you can also watch it on CUTV Sports 1 on our YouTube page. And also, Matt, on the Kyle Vulcans page, uh, the on-demand feature with the, uh, the live feed is pretty nifty as well, if you want to talk about that. Yeah, something new this year. We're continuing our partnership with Sidearm, stretching a little bit there. Not only did the website and live stats, but live video this year. Uh, shortly after the game, five, ten minutes after the game, hopefully, uh, if everything works well with the streaming, that you'll be able to watch it instantly and pull it back, rewind it, basically almost like your own personal DVR. If you can't wait till Tuesday, uh, hopefully that's a feature for you. And it's one of those things that if you can have it multiple places, uh, more people can see it. So either calvalkins.com slash watch or YouTube uh, with CTV Sports 1. As I said before, if you, if you say you can't keep track of the game, shame on you, because not only that, Matt Staff's also live tweeting. So there's literally 20 different ways of following the game. Um, but that's it for this week. Matt, thanks again. Uh, hopefully uh, next week we'll be talking about a, a big win against uh, Shippensburg and looking on to the uh, start of PSAC West play. PSAC West play is going to be a challenge this year, no doubt. Uh, but need to get back on the winning track, so hopefully the Vulcans can do it with Ship this week. Once again, that's 1 o'clock Saturday, California, Shippensburg. Uh, Root on the Vulcans, and hopefully uh, we'll go 2-1. and one. For Matt Kiefer, I'm Gary Smith. You're watching California Vulcans Football 2015. We'll see you next week.